Okay, good morning. <clears throat> Before we start here with the uh, next section, I, I, so I've been uh, looking at your tests, uh, the quizzes. Again, um, I want to make sure you all understand, right? This is a monkey, right? Right? When the monkey takes my tests, yes, there are 10 questions, and he only has to ask true or false, yes? Although he didn't learn anything, yes, he can still get five out of 10, right, right? Just by guessing, yes? So when you take the test, yes, and you have a question that is wrong, yes, you lose a point, okay? So that means you have student A and you have student B, yes? And student A answers 10 answers, yes? Yes, he gives 10 answers. And student B gives seven answers, yes? The student A, yes, has made, has not learned the lesson. He has guessed everything, yes? And he has made three errors, yes? Okay, so excuse me, yep, three errors. And this has, he has made zero errors, yeah? Okay, so this person gets seven points, right? And this point gets seven points, okay? Okay, but say now, it's probably clear, say he gave uh, seven answers, yeah, three errors, sorry, I, I, I missed it, uh, seven errors, three answers, he's got, he, his points is four points, right? And this is seven points, okay? So he gives 10 answers, he only gives seven answers, but he has learned his lesson, right? He, he, he knows what the correct answers are, yes? So, and he doesn't answer the ones he doesn't know, right? Uh, here, I assume that when he gives answers, he's just guessing, right? So you get minus. This is not, this is a common way to evaluate uh, multiple choice questions, right? Because you can always guess. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't know anything, yeah, will have just be lucky, yes? And certainly if you have two, two, only two possibilities, not three or four, then it's even, you know, your, your chances of getting the right uh, answer is. So don't forget that when you take a, the, the tests. Because if you give 10 answers and uh, six are wrong, you don't get four points, you get zero points, okay? Okay, so, so just, I just want to make sure that we all understand this, okay? So the, the, the idea is just make sure you, uh, you go through the material. You go through the material and, uh, you know, if you didn't learn it, just don't answer. Or you don't remember, don't answer. And, uh, right, I just wanted to know, the first class I asked you to, Write down your name. This, is there somebody called Ahmad Sadi Mad? No, it is not taking the class, I guess. All right. Just wanted to know if that person was there. Okay. So, um, so uh, today, this uh, uh, session, we'll, we, we want to talk about standards. Uh? So, um, because in practice, when people buy and sell steel, they're not involved in research at all. Yeah? They just want a steel for their application, yes? And um, so uh, when they describe the steels, they use standards. Hmm? So let's have a look at what standards are. They're basically classification methods to identify steel grades. Steel grades are what say steel, types of steels. Hmm? And why do we use standards? And why are standards so important? Hmm? Because it 
guarantees quality, product quality, reliability, and interchangeability. You can compare two products, two steel products with one another. And usually these standards are coherent and they're simple and they should be convenient. And usually they, you know, a steel will have a name or a symbol or a number or letters or a combination of names, symbols, letters, etc. And attached to these grade names are uh, is information about their composition, perhaps the dimension of the steel. We'll see that there are some uh, grades are specified by the dimension of this, the steel, strangely enough. Um, uh, mechanical properties, of course, or other properties. Hmm? Uh, for instance, for electrical steels that are used for to make transformers, the magnetic properties will be very important. Hmm? Right, so what we'll, we'll uh, go through the, uh, some, the development of standards and material science, and of course, mainly that is uh, physical metallurgy that's behind it, uh, these standards. Uh, that, that's the basic uh, of the standards, but a lot of the input comes from professional engineering societies, hmm? from people involved in uh, the use and the trading of uh, steel. So the trade associations play a role, government regulation agencies play a role, uh, or also official uh, standardization institutes, such as, for instance, the uh, ISO, International Standardization Organization, which is an international organization. So they all uh, have their input. So, um, so in general, this is not specific for steel, specific for all the alloys and metals and materials, yes? Mm. So in general, when we look as, uh, you know, as uh, steel researchers at low carbon steels, we, you know, we, we say, oh, you know, look at the phase diagrams and we say we have, um, we have uh, steels which have less than 2% of carbon and some of them will be um, hypoeutectoid, some of them will be hypereutectoid, and you know the steels are here somewhere. Um, yes, uh, and of course, cast irons are a different group of uh, uh, ferrous alloys, which we will not talk about, but they're also standardized. And then we have a whole group of non-ferrous alloys and metals, which also are standardized in similar ways. Okay. All right. This is a very interesting, this first approach is a very interesting approach, but it's just physical metallurgy. It's not very useful in practice. Huh? Because in practice, what happens is somewhere you start by making steel, yes? You cast that material, you turn it into slabs or blooms or billets, and you go through a plant that turns it into pipes or plates, sheet material, coated or uncoated, yes, sections, hmm? uh, like I-beams, hmm? uh, and then you also have products that are uh, bars uh, steel, rods, like these uh, rebars, wire uh, products, yes. So you can already see here that there is, for both for the producer of steel, this is typically what comes out of a steel plant, yes? And you can obviously see there is no product here. You, this will probably, may become a car or may become a, you know, something else. And this may become part of a boat, a ship, and this, uh, you know. But, so the user, yes, will be using these things, right? So, they need to specify, they don't want to, go to specify the metallurgy of these things and the physical metallurgy is pointless, of course, right? So, so a product um, comes out of a plant, a steel, yes? And um, so this industrial plant is processing, uses raw materials, yes? 
in order to control the process, it uses information technology, automation. There is an IT infrastructure that controls the whole flow of materials and what happens to them. So product has is the result of some composition, thermal processing, mechanical properties, yes? And then there is, it has application properties, yes? And that all leads to a product with grade specifications. And this, this particular beam here has specification, yes? It's a certain steel, it's used in a certain application, Yes, it's got a grade specification according to a certain standard. Okay. Again, we have our plant makes a steel product, and this steel product, you know, many of us, uh, when you're involved in in steel research, you have tunnel vision, right? You are working on texture development of low carbon steels or you know, texture develop of or grain gr control of grain growth in uh, heat resistant steels that's your thing right and but a product has mechanical properties geometrical properties microstructural properties which may be important and then technical properties yes what is a technical property well weldability yeah Magnetic properties, resist, electrical resistance, polarization, resistivity, etc. Okay. And all these are important when you talk about the product. Yes? Because when a car maker buys a piece of steel, he's not really interested in the grain size or the physical metallurgy of the grain. He just wants a product that will enable him to make a car. Okay? Okay, so he's not going to specify according to Kim dong es PhD results, I want this steel, yes? He's going to specify a very specific uh, product. So how, how should we try to understand this from our point of view? So I like to use, or, or to, 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 to think about it as, you know, think about steels as having a steel design chart. Hmm? So what the user wants is some kind of performance index. Huh? And it, it can be very varied, but let's say we're interested in mechanical properties, for instance, it will need strength, a certain strength. Huh? Okay. Now this property is coming from structure and processing, hmm? and you see all the parameters that can play a role, yes? And that performance index is usually attached to a property, yes? It, it may not be very clear, but let's, let's have a look at what I mean by giving an example, right? So the performance is something you find attached to the grade specific technical requirements, right? So in the, in the grade specification, you'll never find something about perlite transformation kinetics, yes? The grade specific technical requirements are these type of things. They're basically, you know, how strong is the material? What's the yield strength tested in, under these and these conditions, all right? So, Let's have a look with a, a typical example. For instance, automotive steel grades for exterior panels r require very high formability, yes? So one of the very important parameters is the Langford parameter, the ratio of the width strain to the thickness strain measured on the sheet material, yes? Okay, that is, what, what property is this? Yes, it's a formability property. That would be in the column of properties. In terms of the structure, 
what does this mean? Hmm? It's related to crystallographic texture and the sharpness of the texture. And in terms of the processing, where are the buttons that you can uh, 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 press to control the, um, the crystallographic texture? Well, they're indicated here. Some of them are related to composition, the vacuum degassing, the alloying of the steel, and some to processing, in particular the cold rolling and the annealing conditions. Okay? So these parts are the kind of, uh, these three columns as it were, in particular the ones uh, towards the two on, the, on the, the, your right hand side, are the, are the steel design uh, parameters that we are using. These here, this is what the grade specifications are all about, yes? Is defining how the steels uh, perform in terms of the needs of the user, okay? Okay, well, let, let's, let's use it, let's have a look at a, uh, uh, a steel made by POSCO here. Okay, you can see it's a coil. It's, yeah. And you see it's made by Guangyang Works. And on the, the label, it's got information for the customer. I, I can see it's um, Xinhan Precision Industries. Yes, so it's an engineering company. Uh, and you can see underneath uh, so underneath the name of the company, there is JIS G3131SPHC, right? That defines the product that, that uh, uh, Xinan Precision Industries ordered from POSCO. Yes? Yes? So what does this mean? Yes? Because that's the only... That's how they order their steel. We want this, yes? So what does this mean for, well, first of all, uh, uh, I, you, you can say that already, first of all, it's, they used a Japanese steel grade uh, naming method, yes? And they used a certain um, standard, a certain standard, yes? So, and the number code of that standard is G31031, yes? And the steel itself is SPHC, and uh, very often these letters are short for something else. S means it's a steel, yes? P stands for plain, yes? Plain carbon steel. We'll see in a moment uh, what it means. H stands for hot rolled, yes? And C, it's a commercial quality, yes? means regular properties, yes? Okay? And that's it, basically, yes? And if you want to know exactly what these regular properties are or this level of carbon, you have to go to the standard, yes, to this GIS G3131 to find out what, these, what this is, yes? Just a little diversion here, uh, because we never talk about money when we do research. But a coil like this, when you see this on the road, do you have any idea what it costs? Yes? It costs about, uh, in, in 2003, about $620 per ton. Yes? And um, you, see, I, you can see on the, every uh, coil is uh, weighed separately. You can see it's a, 11,530 kilos, right? So this coil costs about a little over $7,000. Uh, that's a very, this is a very basic steel, yes? So that's, you can almost say, this is like a, uh, the, 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 the cheapest steel you can get, hot rolled, commercial quality, yes? Um, okay. So automotive steels, which will be uh, cold rolled, which may have coatings, can cost 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, depending on 
Uh, yes. When you uh, pay for something, you not only pay for the material, you also pay for transportation. Huh? So who pays transportation? Okay. You buying from me? I have the material. You know who's paying for the material coming to your plant? Always important. Yes, because uh, of course, if you transporting from uh, Pohang to Ulsan is not very far. But if you're transporting from Pohang to Shanghai or um, um, to um, an automotive plant somewhere in North America, Detroit, yeah, it's expensive, more expensive than going to Ulsan. So it's always very important. The prices are always quoted. So FOB, yes? So FOB, uh, if you ever... Uh, confronted with this, you always have to ask what it means. And you won't sound silly because it means different things in different countries. Yes? Most people, like in Europe and in Asia, when you say free on board means the seller pays transportation yeah? to the point of shipment. Yes? And the buyer pays the cost of transport insurance, unloading, and transport to, to, uh, from the arrival port to the final destination. Yes? Yes. And also the risks yes, are, uh, you know, when, when does it stop being my coil and it's your coil, right? Uh, the, the passing risk occur when the goods pass the rib, ship's rail at shipment. Why do we need to have all these details? Because you have, sometimes you have accidents. You know, coils sometimes fall off the truck or off the train or, the tr you know, or they fall off the crane, yes? So who, you know, does the client have to pay for this, hmm? yeah, et cetera? In the U.S., they use the word FOB origin, which means that the buyer pays shipping and takes responsibility when the goods leave the seller's premise. Yes? It means as soon as it, it, it comes out of the gate of POSCO, it's the client's problem. Yes? But you also have FOB destination. That means the seller pays everything, yes, till the buyer takes possession. Yeah? Okay? So, um, as I said, FOB can mean very different things. Um, and um, things are not finished when the product is finished. Yes, they have to get to the, the client and things like this. Okay, anyway, that was just um, uh, a small detail here that I thought, I thought might be of interest to you. So, um, interchangeability, okay? Let's look at the example we have. Yeah. Uh, so we, have, uh, we had the standard, JIS, JIS stands for, by the way, uh, uh, Japan, Institute for Standardization. It's very, very widely used in Asia, yes? And it doesn't mean that Korea doesn't have steel standards. Korea has its own steel standards, but nobody really uses them, yes? Uh, in Europe, we had the same thing for many years. Every country had their own standards. British had their standards, the Germans, the French, Italians, very complicated. Now that there is a European Union, we have single EN steel uh, standards, which is much more convenient, yes? And uh, the US, of course, um, and Canada have had, um, the US, I have to say, have had their own standards for, for many years. And so these are the main standards that people are using, the GIS, um, the uh, EN, European Normalization Standards, and then you have in the, in the US, uh, there's much less government influence on standardization. You have more professional societies, like the Society for Automotive Engineers has standards, the American Institute for Iron and Steel, hmm? um, the um, and ASTM, Mechanical Engineering Society, 
American Society of uh, uh, Mechanical Engineering, etc. We'll talk about this in a moment. So, um, and, and because America is such a big market for for any product, basically any material, they also have a big international impact. Yes. So, so, so let's just. And that's why I'm concentrating on these. It doesn't mean that uh, the the standards, Korean national standards, are not good. They're perfectly good, but you know, chances are you you know you will probably not use them very much. Yes. Um, okay. So, so let's have a look at um, this standard here. 3131 SPHC. So there is a we can find in in the uh, uh, in the U.S., an equivalent steel, yes, and uh, ASTM A36, or or also well known as A283. Uh, if I'll don't worry about the numbers here, right? I'll, I'll I'll go hopefully be able to give you some insight about the numbers and 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 and, and then the European um, uh, normalization. For this grade would be S275, uh, yes? Okay, so, so um, this, uh, this particular uh, steel, hmm, types of steel here that are regulated or, uh, according to GIS 3131, uh, that's not, doesn't control, doesn't describe only one steel. It, um, it gives... Uh, data on the uh, uh, properties of other steels. And so, so SPCH will be commercial. And that's a really basic hot rolled grade. Uh, but you can, you can also have hot rolled grades that are easily uh, press formed. And so we call them drawing qualities. Yes? And instead of a C, there is a D. Yes? Or you can have deep drawing hot rolled qualities and then you have an E here yeah for the E of extra deep drawing hmm? okay um, and uh, so, so you can see here for instance that uh, these steels are very comparable uh, uh, strengths however the um, requirements in terms of compositions are tighter yes okay Okay, let's, let's have a look at um, another uh, product here. It's also made in Korea by a subsidiary of POSCO called uh, POSCO Special Steels, yes. And, uh, and here we can see similar type of label on the product, yes. Not all the products that come out of a steel plant uh, are sheet or wire, some of them are, are just billets that will be processed by clients, yes? So this billet has already a sticker, yes? And it says, again, GIS, yes? Uh, you can see that POSCO does not use uh, Korean uh, standards at all. This, as far as I, I can't even see a, uh, yeah. Um, so again, um, GIS, so it gives you the standard, 4105. Hmm? Uh, that is a uh, Japanese industry standard code number. That's the number of the, the um, basically the number of a document where this information is, right? Yes. And uh, it says SCM440, okay? Um, okay. So what does this mean in this case? Again, it's GIS. Yes. The S stands for steel. The C stands for chrome. And the M stands for molybdenum. Okay. So this is an entirely different steel. Yeah. Okay. You wouldn't be able to know this if there wasn't this curve. Yes. I, I wouldn't be able to tell, you know, just from looking at the steel coil, that it was a very cheap hot rolled material with you know commercial grade uh, this is a much more advanced material yes much more highly alloyed yes obviously it contains chrome and moly 
Um, so, uh, and I, as I say here, it's a continuously cast billet, and it's used to make. It can be used to make wire rod, yeah? and, uh, and 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 this wire rod itself can then be turned into ball bearings, nuts, bolts, wires tire cord, springs, yeah, you name it. Hmm? All right, so again, let's um, have a look at, uh, first of all, equivalency. So, uh, so the SCM440 uh, Japanese uh, have uh, this symbol for it. In the US, there are equivalent grades, yes? And um, the American Iron and Steel Institute and the Society of Automotive Engineers have an equivalent grade, which is called 4140, yes? Every standardization uh, group has different ways of doing things, okay? This particular AIS, um, AISI and SAE, they only use numbers, right? So. Uh, uh, but if somebody tells you what these numbers mean, you know, you can suddenly you know, see that number and you know what it is. So, uh, and, and we'll see that in a moment. The uh, European normalization is a little bit nicer to everybody, you know, because it's just, there's no mystery about the name, okay? So it says 42 CRMO4, okay? So you can obviously see you don't have to think, you know, what the C could mean or what the M could mean, right? You, you know, it's it's chrome and moly. Yeah? We'll see that in particular for the uh, European uh, normalization scheme, the 42 is related to the the mass percent of uh, carbon, and this the four here is related to the chrome content times four. So. Four means there's actually 1% of chrome in it. Hmm? So that's, that's the only problem with the European way, is you need to know the conversion factor for this number. But usually it's four, unless it's different. <laughs> so again, um, right, and there are molybdenum additions. We can see this because it's in the, in the reading. In this case here, um, I also know it's a chrome moly because it starts with a 40. And, and I know that it starts with a 4, it's a chrome moly steel. But that's because I know this and you don't know it. But uh, um, but, but after today you will know it, okay? So um, this steel, again, is, is a medium carbon steel. It's alloyed with chrome and a moly and uh, obviously we know that chrome and moly uh, increase the hardenability of your steel, yes? So um, we'll be able to make things that are high strength, and uh, one application is, for instance, bolts, yes? Uh, and, and that is done by uh, a process of uh, different process steps, ferrodizing annealing, cold heading, hmm? uh, cold heading uh, being forming, and then heat treatment to, to get the, the final uh, uh, property and um, the bolt and the nut have the, are not the same metal. Okay. Okay. So this is a typical composition. The grades specification. So if you buy the grade specification, yes, it doesn't give you a composition. Yeah? It gives you a range. Let me get a pen here. It gives you a range for the carbon content. Yes a range for the manganese content. It may specify a, a certain amount of silicon. Usually this is a maximum, yes, that is specified, a maximum. And it gives you a range for chrome and for, for moly. Yeah? And if you take, for instance, this uh, a particular example, uh, the composition is here. And you see that the steel maker is free to choose within this range what he provides, yes? But lo and behold that he sells a steel under this name with this much chrome, yes? 
and there is a problem with the product, this will be a major problem because this is the specification and the specification with regards to the composition is very strict, yes? So, again, typical applications for this is uh, bolts, as I said, but you, gears, shafts, couplings, spindles, etc. cetera. Um, in general, in the machinery applications. Uh, the carbon content, this is important here, is relatively high. So that means the, uh, the welding may be uh, difficult, yes? Or, or so, so in order to ensure uh, good weld, uh, good weld uh, quality, you will need to preheat the material and stress relieve it after the welding. Okay. So the material, what's very interesting is that a material hmm, um, does not necessarily um, go from the steel plant to one client and then becomes a product. There may be different steps, yes? And the material can change hands a couple of times. And an example is, for instance, with, with, uh, the, uh, with making bolts, hmm? bolts, we call this, the steels that are used to make bolts, we call them cold heading qualities. Cold heading that describes the process, the mechanical deformations we use to make um, bolts, bolts, nails, uh, screws, uh, we call them fasteners. You know, to, to use them to fasten things to one another, yes? So, and the, the steel qualities, we call them cold heading qualities, okay? So they usually, uh, when you make uh, bolts, you start from wire rod, yes? And the wire rod may uh, or originally have been billets, the billets that I showed you, right? Okay, so these wire rods, these, these billets don't necessarily stay in the, comp in the steel company. They may be st sold straight from the steel company to a wire rod manufacturer. Yeah? So this wire rod manufacturers, then the first thing they do, they, they soften the material, yes? And they may uh, draw it, yes, to a certain uh, diameter. Yeah? And then they usually spherodize it before they do the cold forming hmm? to get very low strengths and so that they can achieve easy forming of the bolt, yes? And eventually, yeah, when th once they have the bolt, they will do a quench to martensite, yeah? heat treatment, and then a tempering. Yeah? So this particular step here of spherodizing, yes, where you reduce, you can see here the strength is originally very high, very hard material, yes? After the spherodizing, it's reduced by more than half, yes? And that is because we, it's an example here of spherodizing, we turn the perlite here, yes, into ferrite plus spherodized uh, cementite, and that makes the material very soft, okay? So this process takes a long time, this spherodizing, this is an example here. Hmm? For instance, uh, if you want to spherodize uh, iron carbon, um, you know, it takes you 100 hours, so you know, a few days to spherodize this. If the material is alloyed with nickel or moly or chrome, it takes even longer, okay? This, this ferrodizing process is, is, is very important. Again, um, the nut here is not made with um, the same type of steel, but it's made with uh, medium carbon steel that doesn't contain any chrome or uh, moly. All right. Not only, so this steel here that is used to make the bolt, yes, we need to, yeah, we need not only to have spherodizing information, we also need to have the quench and tempering information. Yeah? And, and by the way, um, 
So the process of uh, making wire, yes, and spherodizing may happen at one specific client, and then the, the process of making fasteners themselves usually happens by specialized firms who, who actually make the bolts or, yes. And so, as I said, there may be two or more uh, guys, companies in between, the steel maker and the bolt maker, the bolt manufacturer. Okay, so let's uh, go on here. So for the last step, again, um, you will need to, the, the person who makes the bolts will need to know at what uh, a temperature he could uh, forge this, at what temperature he can anneal the material, um, what, normalize it, and, in, and really important is the hardening and the tempering. So how, at what temperature does he have to uh, anneal it? What is the minimum cooling rate he has to achieve to make the structure martensitic? Mm -hmm. and, and what is the, uh, the tempering uh, conditions that uh, he has to use? Okay? This information is usually not standardized, not provided in the, uh, the standards usually, but it's provided by the steel manufacturer um, to the, the companies that, that buy the steel. Hmm? Another example here, yeah? this time we look at a, a material that is turned into um, um, a uh, geared uh, wheel here with uh, carburized, that means surface hardened uh, gear wheels, yes. So this is a AISI uh, 5120, which is the same as the SCR422. You are, now you know that if it starts with an S, it's a GIST standard, yes. And S stands for steel, and CR stands for chrome. Hmm? So it's a chromium steel, yes. This is the equivalency, yes. And uh, so usually these, these billets, this is a cast billet, yes, will be forged and machined, yes, to, uh, to get the, sh the, the gear wheel, yes. It will be heated, yes, and at the same time carburized. Carburized means you diffuse carbon in the surface layer, so you get uh, uh, resistant against uh, abrasion. Um, and then you quench and temper the wheel, and then you get this, uh, the gear uh, uh, wheel, and you get a product. Hmm? So important here is uh, compositions. You can see here carbon contents 0.2, yes? Um, but the, the, really the, the key addition here is the chromium, yes? And again, it's to make the steel hardenable. Now, uh, you've already seen here uh, when I discussed uh, steel grades according to specifications, I was talking about the, uh, the composition, yes? But there are grades uh, where composition is not the only thing, and um, it can even be dimensions. So for instance, um, you have specifications for rails. Yeah? Now, you're probably only familiar with rails that are used for trains, yes? Um, but you use um, uh, uh, rails for many other applications. So, you know, one of the uh, applications um, is cranes. You know, anything that uh, is heavy um, can be uh, moved around on, on uh, steel rails, yes? And um, very often uh, these rails are, uh, the, the grades for these uh, rails are described, again, in, sp in special specification. In the case of rails, it's the uh, UIC, 
Um, UIC is a professional, international professional organization that uh, deals with rails and rail infrastructure. And UIC stands for, it's a French word, it says, it's International Railroad Association, Union Internationale des Chemins de Fer, it's in French. And um, um, so the uh, very common type of rail is UIC 60. Yeah? And you would think that that is a you know, steel grade. Actually, it's the shape of the, the, the rail. And in particular, the 60 refers to the mass of the rail per meter. Yes? So if you have the, the, the section is defined, the, the section, yeah, these, these, these uh, um, sizes and the shape of the rail is fully defined by the, um, the grade specifications and so it should weigh about 60 kilograms per uh, meter so that's what we call it UIC 60 and, uh, and, and the specific uh, uh, specification is UIC 860 there are of course composition and strength requirements for the steels then w w that you make rails from and these are uh, for instance, in Europe, covered by EN uh, 13674. Hmm? And these are interesting. You can instantly recognize them because they start with an R, R for rail, yes. And the number, very conveniently here, doesn't refer to strength or tensile strength or yield strength, but refers to hardness according to the Brunel scale. If you ever wondered who uses the Brunel scale, well, now you know. Steel, and not steel people, um, railroad people use Brunel scale. Mm -hmm. And um, why would they use hardness? Well, that's because it, that's the most important uh, uh, property of, of rails, is the, the rolling on the rails um, creates a lot of frictional damage. So you need to have high hardness. Yeah? So the strength is of course important and uh, the, uh, the yield strength is important, but what's really important in practice is the hardness, okay? Uh, and by the way, typical uh, tensile strengths of rails are uh, 1300 megapascals, so it's really hard material, yes? Um, depending on the applications, other specifications. So crane rails are different, right? So they, you, not the same specifications, okay? Um, but it's a, I like the, the example of the rail uh, steels because it shows you that for the ap because of the application, the, the, the grade specifications and what's important in the grade can vary widely. Hmm? Okay. So let's uh, now go into, um, you know, leave the examples and go into our uh, standards. Hmm? So let's look at um, what would I, I think you should know about the GIST standards. Hmm? Well, um, we have, first of all, the GIST standards for materials, for steels, the specification, the grades, they all start with S and yes, because these are the steels. GIS is a, is a, um, a normalization institute that does not only normalization for steel, right? They normalize everything else. Copper alloys, aluminum alloys, magnesium alloys, plastics, etc. right? So when they, the great specification for steels is with the S. Huh? So you recognize them this way. Um, for the alloy steels, you can also instantly recognize them. Chrome, chrome moly, nickel chrome, nickel chrome moly, hmm? okay? We can, by comparison of the grades, define equivalents. Hmm? For instance, these would be the American Iron and Steel Institute equivalents for these steels. Um, they have uh, carbon steels, for instance, structural steels, which you will see, uh, you should also know, st structural uh, uh, steel here, excuse me. Uh, 
and then C for constructional, yes. Free cutting steels, spring steels, SUP7, bearing steel, SUJ2, and uh, there the, the lettering is a little bit, um, uh, you know, not logical. But anyway, um, an important thing uh, that I've uh, marked in, uh, in red here, yes, are the two last digits, and you see that the two last digits of the GIS and the AISA uh, coincide very often, yes. Here the 20 coincides with here. And that is um, the carbon content times 100. So, so this is 0.3 carbon. This would be 0.2 carbon, 0.6 carbon, and this is 1% of carbon. All right. Good. Let's look now at the uh, EU standards. Yes. So the US, EU standards have had the advantage that uh, many countries collaborated in it. And so uh, the system is a little bit, um, I, th I think the information in the name is a little bit more informative. But there again, you know, it, it, you have to um, remember some um, of the details. Hmm? So this is the name of this, the, the important standard, EN 127-1. Uh, it has two approaches to classifying steels. Hmm? So one, the first classification is based on, is related to properties, yes, and the other classification scheme emphasizes composition, yes? So, so the first classification is a combination of a letter code hmm, related to application and a number code related to properties, okay? So the, so the mechanical properties we talk about are usually the yield strength in megapascal and the application codes, yes? are based on the first letter of the application. For instance, S is structural steel, D for drawing steel. High strength steel is H. Pressure vessel steel is P. T is for tin plate or packaging steels. And M is for electrical steels with magnetic, mm. magnetic properties. Mm. And then the second way of classifying the steel grade is based on the chemical composition, yes? And, and here we have, and there it becomes a little bit difficult, we have subgroups, yes? And all the standards go into, it doesn't matter, GIS or um, AISI or EN, they, always, they all have this, this uh, approach. Yeah? So first, there is a subgroup one, where we basically have unalloyed steels, yes? which usually refer to as commercial grades, yes? unalloyed steels. And in the European norms, it's C, unalloyed steels with manganese contents, oops, less than 1% in weight. The second is unalloyed with manganese contents up to 1% and any other alloying element less than 5%. And usually, there's nothing in front of that, uh, there's no symbol for these grades. Then we have X, yes? When you see X in front of a uh, European uh, steel denomination, it always means it's alloyed. And the alloying level is 5%. So there is, when, as soon as you see X, it means the steel contains more than 5% of an alloying element. Yeah? And then we have, we have special, there's most uh, uh, standardizations have special um, uh, grades for high speed steel hmm? because they're alloyed with high levels of very strong carbide formers such as tungsten, moly, and vanadium and also alloyed with cobalt, okay? So let's make it simple. Let's just give a, a, some example here. Hmm? So um, a, a, um, a company, a construction company can uh, buy a steel called S3 
five five. Okay. So what does this mean? If this is this, yes. So so the first symbol is a letter. Then we have three numbers: number, number, number. And then there may be some symbols here, which are related to requirement symbols. Yes which is a number and a letter, yes? And extra symbols which are additional requirements, for instance, related to the processing, thermal treatments, and coatings. Hmm? Okay, so let's have an example here. S355 means S stands for structural steel. It has the S of structural steel. The 355 means a minimum of 355 megapascal of yield strength. I, so this is a constructional seal that will be used to make, build something with it, yes? Um, uh, right, so I, I can stop there. But I can also order a steel which has j symbols JR behind it. That means there is an additional requirement in terms of toughness. Yes? Toughness. So, for instance, if it's a shipbuilding grade, I'm going to use it for uh, uh, or a, um, to, uh, to build part of a, uh, a platform for the oil industry. Yes? I, uh, I can require some minimum toughness requirements. And they're defined here as JR. We'll see in a moment what this means. And, um, for instance, we know that um, when you ha want high toughness, you want fine grains, yes? When you purchase the steel, you can require that it be normalized, that it went through a final heat treatment where they austenitized the material and cooled it back down. That the two times you do the transformation, gives me grain refinement, right? So you add a requirement N. Yeah? So this is what you order, for instance. Hmm? An S355JRN. Hmm? Okay? Um, there are many symbols, okay? The one we just described here for this, this additional treatment is normalized, is here, right? But uh, you can ask for, for instance, the material can be, you can request it to be as rolled. You, you don't want it material annealed. You'll do it, your, the client will do it himself, yes? Or you want to use it in the cold, deformed state, so as rolled. Hmm? Okay. Okay, etc. So there are plenty of, of uh, possibilities here. Yeah? Or, or you want it Q and T plus Q and T, quench and temper, that's very often used, yes? Hmm? All right, about this uh, um, uh, toughness, I just want, for those who are not familiar with this, this is a, a toughness tester. Hmm? You, you put your sample here, looks like this, and you hit it with this big hammer that is, so this big hammer is sitting here. This hammer slams into your sample here and it breaks or it doesn't break the sample, yes? When, it, when you do this, with this dial gauge here, you can measure the energy that is absorbed during the, the hit, yes? Okay, and that is the way we use uh, 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 to define toughness. So what you, what you often get with uh, ferritic steels is that at this, when, you, when you measure the absorbed energy, yes, on this dial here, yes? Um, you find that there are, there's usually a temperature where the, um, uh, there is a huge drop in the um, uh, toughness, yes? And it, these temperatures are usually low, but, they, you know, not, uh, not, you know, th these are still temperatures that, that do occur in the, um, in nature, so um, we're very concerned about this, and that's why certain constructional steels have this requirement for a minimum toughness, for instance, a minimum toughness of 27 joules at a certain temperature. 
Yes? Okay, so and that, that is this requirement that we just saw. We, remember we had S355 was our steel. Yes, 355JR. Yeah. Right, so here is JR. It means that the um, impact energy, yes, minimum uh, impact energy that the steel will have at 20 degrees C will be 27 joules. Yes? Okay? But I can also say, I could have also asked for an a S355K2. Uh, yes? That means that here I want a minimum of 40 joules at minus 20. Okay? So this is a much harder uh, toughness requirement. Okay? And you can specify a steel according to this. Yes? Okay. Um, another example, let's see, um, of, of this EU standard. Say we have a steel called DCO, DCO3, ZE. Okay, what does this mean? Well, again, it's our EU standard. So D is an, an application, yes. D stands for cold drawing, uh, sorry, uh, drawing steel. The application properties, again, three numbers, uh, excuse me, first a letter and then numbers. Then uh, requirement symbols, which can be alphanumeric. Yes, alphanumeric means it can be a letter, a combination of letters and numbers. And then extra symbols require, uh, which are also uh, related to what you need or what you want in terms of processing, thermal treatments, or coatings. Okay, so this is the example. DC3, <coughs> excuse me. C stands for cold rolled. And O3, in the case of drawing, does not refer to strength, but refers to the level of formability, O1 to O6. O1 is just commercial grades, teal formability, and O6 is for very formable interstitial free grades. Instead of this C, you, you can have a D if it's hot rolled, and X if it's not specified, yes? Um, in this case, there, I don't have a requirement symbol, uh, but I have a ZE. This means that ZE stands for a galvanized coating, and the E stands for electro-galvanized. Uh, galvanized means zinc coating, of course. So it has to be, the, the coating has to be applied in an electro-galvanized manner, in, by electro-galvanization, not by hot dipping, okay? But there, you know, so for instance, if the steel had to be uh, uh, for, uh, suitable for enameling, to apply an enamel layer, for instance, there would be an EK here, hmm? suitable for enameling. Okay. Right. So there's a couple of examples where um, you see uh, one way in which uh, the steel can be specified, yes, with the, uh, the requirements clearly in the name. Again, the, that's not the only requirements. You have to get the, the grade uh, booklet, as it were, where there will be all the details about the, uh, uh, the sp specific grades. But so in these EU standards, we can also, we, there is also a method, yes, uh, that, that's used to describe the composition. Hmm? And again, I, I, as I told you, we have four different type of, of uh, steels, yes? In, uh, so we have the unalloyed steels, less than 1% of manganese. Unalloyed steels with manganese up to 1% and all the other elements less than 5%. Alloyed steels, we call those that are one element at least has 5% in weight. And then we have a special um, section for 
the um, high speed steels. It's always best to, to look at an example. So for instance, C35E, for instance. Yeah? C, we know, refers to the fact that it's unalloyed with less than 1% of manganese, yes? The N, these two numerical numbers here, that is the carbon content times 100. So the carbon content is 0.35, yes? So I know the real physical metallurgist will, will have a mole percent or mole fraction or atomic percent. In technology, it's always mass percent. And very often people say weight percent, although weight percent is not really correct. It's mass percent. Yeah. But anyway, so weight percent. And this little E here, yes, is related to a requirement that you have very low sulfur, okay? Another example here uh, for the second one here is 13, yes? This you'll see very often hmm? uh, for, uh, so for instance, the, so the name of the grade will be 13 CRMN. CRMN, four, five, okay? So the first Two digits are carbon contents times 100. CR, excuse me, um, uh, 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 chrome and manganese are the main alloying elements, yes? And the four and the five are related to the amount of uh, chrome and manganese. So four is not 4% of chrome, but it's four divided by four. So it's 1% of chrome. And five, it's not 5% of manganese, it's five divided by four. So recently I was at POSCO and uh, there is a grade, for instance, nowadays, it's called 22 NMB5, yes? This doesn't mean that it has five ppm of boron in it. It has nothing to do with boron, yes? Uh, so, first of all, the two, there is no symbol in front, right? No X or no C, so you know it's alloyed, but everything is less than 5%, and the manganese, you know, uh, content will be given by my, um, um, by, by my, um, by the, the grade uh, symbol here. So 22 means 0.22 uh, carbon. Manganese and boron are the most important alloying elements, yes? And the five is always, the, the first number is always for the first element. Yeah? So the, the five can never be for the boron, okay? It's always for the first element. Right? And, and so, and I have to divide by four. So the composition is 1.25 percent yeah? okay of manganese all right all right so yes um, why 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 is this this crazy system of dividing by four uh, well it, it's because then you don't have to use um, digits like commas or points uh, and it's, well, and, and it makes it easier. You don't have to worry about, you know, when you type things, you don't have to write point 22, right? because maybe somebody makes an error and, and writes 2.2 or point oh two two or something. So there's no, there's no uh, risk of making errors when you copying or writing something because there are no decimal points in, the, in this way. So that's the, re that's the reason behind this, okay? And of course, the, the result is that it makes things confusing because if you don't remember that you have divide to div no, you have to divide by something, but you don't know how much. But anyway, it's four. That's the one I remember, yes? Um, but it's four for chrome, cobalt, manganese for the main alloying elements, yes? It's one. It's divided by 10 for molybdenum, aluminum, etc. yes? 
divide by 100 for cerium, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and divide by 1,000 for boron. Usually, the only one you have to remember is four for you know, the main alloying elements. Yeah. If, um, and if you don't remember the other ones, just make sure you always have this, these lecture notes close by. Now, when the, the alloy concentration is higher than five, yes, you stop doing this, yes? Okay, and now your grade will, for instance, be X, well, let's say G, X, two, Chrome, nickel, moly, 19, 11, 2. Okay, so this would be also a great specification. So what does it mean here? Yes. Um, this, this means that it's a, a casting. It's, it's, it's cast. So, okay, so this I will... Not so important here, but so it X two chrome nickel manganese sorry um, molybdenum nineteen eleven yeah so when you have an X in front of the name you know all the numbers are the right numbers so carbon is zero point zero two yes zero point zero two the chrome I don't have to divide by four it's nineteen percent of chrome. The 11, I don't have to divide by 4, it's 11%. And the 2, I don't have to divide by 10, it's 2 molybdenum. And of course, this is a stainless steel. Yes, it's a stainless steel. And all the stainless steels always start with an X because they have these high levels of alloy. All right. HS for high speed steels, yes. Uh, usually come like this, H, S, and then four numbers. Hmm? Like in this case, two, nine, one, eight. Okay. And so that, that you always know it's a, a high speed steel. And the, the two, nine, one, and eight, they are in sequence tungsten, moly, vanadium, and cobalt. Yes? So you, you really have to know that it's. I don't, I don't even remember how tungsten, moly, vanadium, and cobalt in sequence. So, this, so you basically know it's a high-speed steel, yes? High-speed steel meaning for machining purposes, yeah? Um, and, and these are the compositions of these um, carbide-forming elements and of the cobalt, yeah? All right, so... Um, this is an example here, right? Of course, uh, what, what we're discussing uh, this lecture, and I guess uh, part of the lecture uh, next uh, Thursday morning, is, is just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's uh, a lot of applications, and all these applications have specific grade denomination. But let's have a look, for instance, at tool steels. Yeah, tool steels that, that these are, are steels that, you know, um, for forming tools, like, you know, when you make a, a, a die. Uh, if you look at the big forming presses in the hall here, the dies are not just steel, right? They're not the same steel you make cars with. These are special steels, yes? Die steels, tool steels, we call them tool steel. So, for instance, um, if you do cold work steels, you have forming tools, you have uh, knives. Um, if you do plastics, it's different from steels. If you do cold forming, it's different from uh, hot forming, etc. But um, let's have a look. Um, you, you can still use this simple uh, method to describe the composition. For instance, this says X38 chrome moly 16. Okay. Carbon content 0.38. Chrome and moly are the main alloying elements. There's only one number, so I know it's for chrome, yes? And because there is an X, I should not divide by four. So it's 
of um, uh, um, of Chrome. Yes. Same with here. This is 0.5 carbon, 5 chrome, 1 moly, and I don't know about the vanadium, right? Same here. High speed steel. Oh, this should be an H, H here. I just, I don't, maybe you want to correct it. This should be an H here. Um, so the sequence, yes. Uh, Right, so it's six for the tungsten, then five for the moly, and I guess two for the vanadium. And there is no cobalt, so there's no, there's no number, yeah? for, no fourth number for the cobalt. Okay? So usually you can, you, can, um, you can get a lot of information on this, uh, on this uh, using the uh, European norms. Okay, so... At this stage, the, I've come to the um, AISI and SAE standards. Those are also very, very widely used. So uh, I'll stop here, and we'll, uh, we'll pick up this uh, problem of standardization uh, on, um, on Thursday.